Orange et sur Radio Rectangle. C'est parti pour la troisième saison de Liberation Frequency. Thema Hugues de Castillo au micro. Et pour cette émission de rentrée, je vous propose de vous plonger dans la carrière musicale de Mike Sheet, le leader de Yob. Yob, trio originaire de Jean dans l'Oregon, auteur de cet album dont le dernier en date est paru il y a deux ans via Neurot Recordings sous le titre de Clearing the Path to Ascend. Et c'est avec Quantum Mystic, issu de l'album de Unreal Never Lived, sorti en 2005 via Metal Blade, que l'on démarrait l'émission. Un album qui a précédé la pause carrière de Yob entre 2006 et 2008. Et si l'on parle de Yob aujourd'hui, c'est parce que le groupe est l'une des têtes d'affiche du Desert Fest Antwerp qui se tiendra les 14, 15 et 16 octobre prochains au Trix, date qui clôturera la tournée européenne que le groupe partage actuellement avec Black Cobra, une tournée qui a démarré à l'Incubate Festival le 11 septembre dernier. Et comme avec Liberation Frequency Thema, on tient à vous proposer du contenu exclusif, je vous ai ramené de Tilburg une entrevue avec Mike Shade que l'on vous partage tout de suite. Il n'y aura pas de traduction après les réponses, l'occasion d'approfondir votre anglais. Et la première question porte bien sûr le regard que porte Mike sur la carrière de Yob et son hiatus pendant lequel il a fondé Midian. Well, I guess from 99 to 2005, which is when we were, you know, active in that first chunk of time, when that kind of stopped, it was unfortunate. Like it just was a situation where, you know, the band at the time was divided on touring and whether to do it or not. And you know, touring was very difficult. We didn't have a lot of an audience um, back then, um, even though we were on Metal Blade when we disbanded. Um, so. We just kind of hit an impasse, and it didn't feel like I didn't have it, the heart to just try to find another lineup at that point. And so that's why I started Midian, and it was going to be something fresh. And, you know, still, I mean, I wrote that material, but it was informed by different players. And when um, that kind of fizzled out, you know, within a couple of years, and Yob came back, you know, we, our original idea was to do a show. Like, let's just do a show. And uh, then it was like, well, let's do an album. And we brought, you know, the Aaron came and joined the band. And I really feel like since then, it's just been this constant, not really planned thing. I mean, we're, we plan for a tour, you know, or we plan, okay, we're going to record. We have this music and we need to, you know, make sure to plan it enough ahead to have the studio that we want and the time that we need. And so, I mean, we, we do the work well. But we don't have a future vision, you know, a, a where do you see yourself in five years question. Um, we just kind of tend to feel that as long as we're writing music that we feel passionate about and that is fun to play and medicinal with nobody listening, then that means we can go out and share that with other people. And we're not going to write records to get back out on the road. We're not going to write the records to continue to be relevant. Um, it just has, it's much more internal. So I don't know how to answer the question ultimately because I don't know how long we'll be around. We don't plan, we don't have to be. You know, we, it's a, something that as long as it works and as long as we're inspired, then we continue. Question suivante, fonctionne-t-il avec ce que l'on peut appeler des concept album I don't have a concept behind each album other than just, you know, being authentic with what's there. And what I mean by that is just, you know, there's all different kinds of albums out there and concept pieces around maybe a science fiction theme or a particular movie or a book or people coming up with their own kind of narratives that become a concept album where the theme is essentially like fiction. And the stuff that I write is kind of nonfiction. I mean, it's about where I'm at and what I'm feeling and what I'm working on. And, you know, I've never been able to feel like I can write about anything else and have it be authentic. You know, but I also come a lot from the punk scene. And the punk scene was very much about, you know, at least when I was in it in the 80s, about empowerment, personal empowerment and passion and what you feel and, you know, thinking for yourself and all these themes that ran no rules, no conformity to what anyone says, how you're supposed to feel or think. And so when I'm writing, I just have to write what I'm feeling at the time. And that's what makes it seem like something I can stand on stage with and feel power in. So that's the theme. And just every album is that moment of time captured 
and uh, if it's a good time, then it's about adding some some further joy to it in the music and uh, really sharing it, not just keeping it. Um, the sharing is extremely important, and if it's a dark time, it's about using that as a path to get to a better place and not wallowing in it. Though I love a lot of very depressed, brutally depressed music, that it does wallow in it. So it's uh, you know I just am one of those people that want to use my I have plenty of darkness, but it's not where I want to live. You know, it's what I want to transmute it. That's material to work with. You know, not material. That's not the final act. En 2009, Yob revient aux affaires en signant via Profound Lore et sort The Great Cessation. Un cinquième album produit par Sanford Parker, le musicien, entre autres, de Buried at Sea, Correction Souls ou encore Minsk. Un album dont je vous propose The Lie That Is Sin.
suite de l'interview avec Mike Shade et question suivante question qui porte sur le genre Doom, à savoir ben voilà, comment se situe-t-il par rapport à la classification Doom, bien qu'ils n'abordent pas des sujets comme la drogue ou le satanisme dans leurs paroles. Well, I think with genre, genre is getting trickier all the time, you know, and I think when you use any more, unless it's a quote-unquote true something or other, like pure Swedish death metal or you know, old school, true doom or whatever. If it's not that, then genre is kind of like a, an arrow that's like a merge sign to get on the freeway. But the merge isn't the freeway. It just gets you on there and then it's pretty varied and wide and you go trucking down it. And so I think that that's true for us too. We're just, uh, we're, uh, so I mean, I think saying that if you told somebody that we're doom-ish, You know, or doom like that's more helpful than saying we're death metal but um i'm not sure that we've ever really been in the doom genre like really because we in incorporate so many other things into what we do but um but we love doom metal and certainly doom metal and certain bands have highly informed who we are um, and it's a big part of how we sound but there are certain other aspects that are definitely not metal not doom en rebondissant sur sa réponse précédente, je lui faisais part du fait que le fait d'incorporer des éléments étrangers au dogme du Doom, c'était ça qui permettait de faire évoluer le genre. See, to me, if somebody, whatever they're calling us, if they feel good about it, then, I, then great. You know, I don't care. I don't care what genre we are, really, because it's like, You know, what genre, and I'm not comparing our level, and I'm my fingers near the touching the table when I say lo level, so you understand. I mean, Black Sabbath, what were they? You know, when they were, you know, the term punk came after the bands existed. You know, same with New Wave, same with any genre. Um, so you just have these really courageous musicians that are willing to push past norms and create something that's their own and um, not try to fit into any particular thing. And then later on comes the genre and the rules and you can't do this, you can't do that, you say this, you can't say that. And same with black metal, you look at the Norwegian black metal scene and all the corpse paint and by the time everyone was starting to make all the strict rules of that scene, a lot of those guys were already moving on. They were already dropping the corpse paint, dropping the, not all of them, but a lot of them. Over, Satyricon, Dark Throne, uh, Enslaved, uh, Mayhem. You know, these are all bands that were already aesthetically moving beyond because they didn't want to get caught and confined in these rules that were being made up later on. These were all just super courageous musicians with a vision. And I'm not pretending that we're that, but I do want to create music in that spirit.
vient de faire une petite escapade musicale du côté de Midian, groupe qui n'a pas survécu au procès d'un groupe disparu qui partageait le même patronyme seulement avec un seul D, celui-ci, le Midian, fondé par Mike Shade avec deux D donc, a fait paraître en 2007 via Metal Blade l'album Age Eternal, dans lequel l'on se plongeait avec ce Dreamless Eye. A noter que l'on retrouvait dans le groupe le bassiste Will Lindsay, qui a fait par la suite partie de Wolves in the Throne Room, Night Mystium ou encore Indian. Tout comme Yob Midian explore des thèmes en rapport avec le mysticisme, les philosophies orientales. Question donc, quel est le lien ou l'intérêt de Mike envers ce type de pensée Well, it's pretty sloppy, but it's there. I mean, some Hindu, uh, particularly more on the non-dual sides of, of uh, Hinduism, and non-dual also in like you know Zen Buddhism and and certain other you know philosophers too that had a uh, kind of, you know, uh, Meister Eckhart and um, certain people that were, you know, some quantum physics, physicists and their view of, as they got really close to the end of their knowledge in their studies, you know, very skilled, either meditators or, you know, scientific minds that when they got to the edge of their knowledge and observed things they didn't understand, that it, it cracked open their minds instead of making them small. And with that wonder, I think, comes the, holy shit, what is all this? What is it? You know, we don't know. And with that comes a lot of, I think, you know, you get the sense that there's a lot of humility and a lot of, like, you know, your place in the world isn't quite as solid and, and all the things that we're taught aren't quite so hard, um, even though they can be pushed hard upon us. It's just a lot of people playing along with a certain thing. So the mysticism to me is when, for myself, is just trying to keep my mind open and question what my brain and what other brains are telling me because I think the stuff of the universe more or less just lets us project on it whatever we want. You know, we get to say that couch is purple and it's useful because I can say, look at that purple couch and you look and you're like, yeah, I see it, there it is, perfectly useful. But uh, we don't really actually know what that is. And we can take an electron microscope and you can have a number of scientists that go in and will explain on various levels what those things are. But once again, those are still just labels and it's useful because then other scientists can talk about it. But they still don't know what it is. It's not very useful except everything that the world uses to bomb the shit out of each other is also based on the same principles of a bunch of assumptions about the nature of reality, the nature of a particular God or that particular God. And if a person's of a particular religion, then the tenets of that religion to teach it is helpful, but um, they still don't know what the fuck it is. And that is where, um, for me, just having, you know, it's brought me peace to know that sometimes I think it's easy to run around and think that you're missing something, you know, or you're missing some important piece of knowledge that somehow connects everything. And I would almost say that it's a piece of unknowledge that helps better connect everything, you know, or a lack of knowledge or knowing what is knowledge and what it isn't. But, you know, not being super cheesy or too heady about it because then that just goes into that circular loop of, of living in our brains that's like jumping on the Autobahn and going 110 and it never stops. It's a matter of being able to step off the Autobahn and watch things go by and have just a little more say in it. En 2011, Yob fait paraître Atma, un album dont l'artwork est signé par Stevie Floyd, membre de Dark Castle, et dont le layout, et dont le layout et le logo étaient géré par Aaron Edge, membre d'Imsa, Darkonen ou encore de Lumbar. Ce sixième cru de Yob s'ouvre sur ce Prepare the Ground.
avril 2014, Yob était à l'affiche du Rodburn, festival d'occasion duquel le groupe allait se produire à deux reprises. Un premier concert consacré à l'album The Great Secession qu'ils ont interprété en intégralité et un second set à l'occasion duquel ils ont joué les trois premiers morceaux de Clearing the Past to Ascend, album qui allait sortir en octobre de la même année. Le Roadburn se tenant du jeudi au dimanche avec quelques privilégiés de la profession. J'ai eu l'occasion d'écouter l'album le vendredi matin et c'est un Mike Shade assez anxieux qui était présent au fond de la salle. Dans quel état d'esprit ben, était-il à l'occasion de cette écoute Yeah, I think at that time I was stressed in general. I mean, we'd been in the studio for about three weeks and then we'd There's this kind of uh, group of things that were happening that um, my other band, Vol, was playing a festival called Tree Fort in uh, Boise, Idaho. And that next day was when I was to master the Yob record with Brad Boatwright, but my flight was canceled out of Boise due to um, not enough passengers. And so I had to scramble and I ended up hitching a ride with a band from Portland that helped me out and uh, that were at the festival. So I got there really last minute to master the album, and then we did a number of revisions, and we got the final revision literally three hours before I got on the plane to go to Roadburn. And so um, climbing then onto uh, off the plane to arrive here, and then within hours be in the room with a number of illustrious journalists listening to the album that in my mind I was still turning knobs you know the album wasn't done yet for me and so listening to it on a stereo that I'd never heard before with a bunch of people like you know heads down listening very carefully because they're going to write about it we did it two different times and I think that first one I think I drank five beers before the end of nothing to win um, I was just so nervous and uh, from all of it And at that time, it was so fresh, too. It's like I wasn't even sure if it was good. And yes, it was very personal. So there was kind of that piece to it also. Um, and still kind of being in the place that spawned some of that record. But um, you put out records, that's what you sign out for. So uh, it was okay. It turned out all right. Question suivante qui concerne toujours cet album, Clearing the Past to Ascend. Bah, quels sont les sujets qui sont au centre de cet album? Yeah, none of that's thought ahead of time, really. It's really, you know, in the songwriting process, it just comes back to whatever is feels real in the moment. And it's writing about that, you know, whatever the theme is. You know, I mean, you have those points in your life where you feel like there's a, like a thread, a common thread to what a person's going through, um, whether it be if they're in school for a particular amount of time or in a job or whatever. And there's um, so interacting with those things, you know. So for me, writing that record was just about the theme of what was going on in my life at that time and trying to find the best expression for it that on one hand gave it the space that I wanted the situation to have for myself. Um, so not spelling things out, not making hard exclamation points or hard questions, you know, just really letting it try to live and be a little bit. Um, and I would say if anything, You know, that album and the song like Marrow in particular, I'd done a lot of solo tours um, with acoustic guitar and doing the solo record, the thrill jockey and the solo touring. I don't know that the song Marrow would have come into existence if it weren't for that experience. And uh, because it certainly informed the way I was writing that song. And the only intention in the record that I would say as it was coming into focus was that okay there was working with a lot of heavy feelings and some depression and some kind of maybe existentialist questions going into it that were impassioned you know not not from a distance but very much like what the hell is happening so it was very close uh, very personal and really fleshing that out but the only way it was okay to flesh it out was because then marrow was going to come And Marrow was going to be the song that then was going to take all that kind of dark feeling and then open it up and open up possibilities again and let some of that darkness go and crack open a window and let some fresh air in and uh, have that be 
kind of a literal feeling listening to it, but also like a metaphor as far as, you know, moving forward and having some, some more space to work with.
après avoir écouté Maro, morceau qui clôt le dernier album en date de Yob, à savoir Clearing the Past to Ascend. Je demande à Mike si dans le déroulement de cet album, ben les trois premiers morceaux ne font-ils pas une espèce d'état des lieux de ce que Yob a fait jusqu'à présent, avec notamment le morceau le plus violent écrit dans la carrière du groupe, et que Maro n'amène-t-il pas le groupe vers un nouveau cycle I think that all of those observations have uh, validity. I think the violence in the second song, Nothing to Win, is kind of almost like when you're really trying to push yourself to learn something that maybe you keep kind of walking into the wall with. And so it's kind of a stern voice that's not negative exactly, but it's just trying to really get learn the lesson. So I think that song comes from that place, you know, of just really having to kind of beef up and get fiery about it to try to really burn through that particular way of thinking that was that was kind of being an obstruction.
C'était Nothing to Win que Mike Shade évoquait juste avant. On continue d'explorer l'interview réalisée en début de tournée européenne il y a tout juste 10 jours à Tilburg. Nouvelle question donc qui porte cette fois-ci sur ses performances vocales qui sont sur Clearing the Past to Ascend assez impressionnantes. Question donc, as-tu travaillé ta voix d'une manière différente I mean, I've always worked pretty hard on my voice, though there was a lot of years where I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, I had some natural ability, but I would go through times where I would have horrible shows and have really good shows and not really understand why. And so the horrible shows, of course, were very frustrating and the great shows were a joy. But I didn't, I wasn't really exactly in control of it because I didn't have a good technique. I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I got to a point where I felt like You know, I can't deal with that anymore. And there's a reason why great singers are great and why they're consistently great. And so I started seeing a vocal coach in Portland, Oregon, as a younger guy who uh, is a Berkeley School graduate and his mom's a voice coach as well. But he's a young enough guy that when he hears the crazy stuff that we're doing, he's not wagging his finger. You know, though he understands, of course, that it's it's not good for your voice technically, you know, death roaring and screaming. But with good warm-ups, breath support, good you know body care there's ways that you can do it and do it better and consistently and then if you're sick you have techniques to fall back on to give the best performance that you can because the best of the best of the best have bad nights because their body is the instrument you can't take your throat to the luthier and get the frets changed you know you can't uh, i mean i guess you can get surgery but but that's a much more complex scenario and extreme so i started doing that and then when i joined vol Vol takes everything that I did with Yob, but then ramps it up to 10. And it's, you know, of course, the music's much faster, a lot of downbeats, spitting out words quickly. I mean, I grew up on punk and speed metal and crossover, so none of that is foreign to me. But having to change all those voices in such a fast time. And then, you know, John Cobbett is, you know, very good producer. And he knows what he wants to hear. He's always let me have my ideas and was very open with them. At the end of the day, he pushed me to the pitch. He pushed me to the right thing. He would come up with harmonies that were difficult for me and say, no, we're going we're gonna to do this. And so I had to learn how to do that. And so all that training then went back into Yob Records. Then as I started to get more excited about that, then I went back to my vocal coach and with all of this in mind and It's gotten to the point now where I have a rehearsal space in Eugene that I'll go to three to five days a week just for voice. And I train uh, scales, power training, uh, even just warm-ups, even just going through a warm-up to keep my voice solid. And I've made a lot of choices to try to help make my voice better. Once again, it's a, you know, the voice is flesh and blood, and flesh and blood is susceptible to all sorts of things. So... You know, every night it's just a matter of giving your best. But um, for this album, Vol, and the work we did on the Deeper Than Sky album, very much in, in uh, Deeper Than Sky and also their first record informed how I layered vocals on the new album, and it really did expand my palette. And, and as I learned how to use my voice better, I started finding new voices in me, new places inside my head and chest that I hadn't explored before. And so I... Je pense que c'est très bien un travail en progrès.
on vient d'écouter Vol avec le morceau Lightless Sun, extrait de leur album Deeper Than Sky, sorti en octobre 2015 via Profound Lore, ce qui permet d'enchaîner avec la question suivante, à savoir, ben, peut-il m'en dire plus, à propos de ce groupe Vol Vol is basically four old friends that wanted to make music together and when Ludacra disbanded, John and Aesop weren't done. But they wanted to do something that was a little more fun and you know, a little more they wanted it to be fun and uplifting, kind of a positive, speed metal y, you know, a good time. And uh but they still wanted to play music that was still kind of in that vein. And we'd all known each other for so long. I mean, we, Yob and Midian have done countless shows with Ludacra and Amber Asylum and Agaloc. And so it was just a vehicle for us to all get together and play music. Um, John is the songwriter of that band. I write my lyrics and uh, vocal structures, but I rely heavily on John and Sigrid because they're both classically trained musicians. And um, I, there's a lot to learn. I keep my ears and... Eyes wide open around them. Mike a aussi fait partie d'un trio qui s'appelle Lombard. Qu'est-ce qu'il se trouve derrière ce groupe qui a sorti un unique album il y a de cela trois ans? Lombard, it was uh, Aaron Edge when he was uh, um, diagnosed with MS. I've known Aaron for over a decade and I played in with Yob and Midian alongside many of his bands and he was also the drummer of Brothers on the Cloth for a time and uh, when the MS came around he wrote me and said look I have this collection of songs the idea is that maybe I can start to get some funding to help with my MS bills and I said well let me listen to it you know let's check it out and it's of course you know very good very very good and he'd done it all in GarageBand and, and, I, and he said would, would you write lyrics for this and um, sing And I told him, well, because of the nature of what it is you're doing, if this was just some project that we were doing for you and me, then I'd say yes. But um, I think what we need to do is we need to reach out to one of our friends that has a, a real studio. And so we reach out to Tad Doyle, who's his ex-bandmate and good friend, and Tad didn't hesitate and uh, said, yes, come. And then I told Aaron that I could write the lyrics, but if he wrote them from where he was at, that it was going to be a lot more powerful. It's going to be a lot more emotionally powerful and you're going to be able to tell a story that maybe isn't told in metal scene all the time, you know, as far as lyrics go and where he's coming from in it. And so he wrote all those lyrics that are just, of course, even crazier than we would have thought. Um, he just wrote about his struggles and his anger and frustration with MS. And so... To me, in that project, I was lending my friendship and my voice to him. Um, and then I was able to be creative and help distill his ideas, and I helped shape like how the lyrics sit in. And um, So, I mean, it's not like I didn't have any songwriting in it, but I really, uh, that's really Aaron. Aaron's the, the driving force there. Glad to be a part of. The album. The First and Last Days of Unwelcome, sorti via Neurot Recordings il y a de cela 3 ans. Voici Day 6.
avant dernière question pour Mike Shade de Yob. Vu la scène actuelle qui est originaire de Portland, y a-t-il quelque chose de particulier au niveau de cette ville d'Oregon Well, it's interesting. I don't live in Portland. I live two hours south, but I, a lot of my adolescence as a music fan and you know, years playing in bands too um, was affected by Portland. And Portland of the 80s and 90s and 2000s is very different than the Portland that's existed in the last seven or eight years. Um, I mean, certainly Portland's always turned over amazing bands, you know, Poison Idea, Wipers, Dead Moon. I mean, those are three heavy hitters right there it's always turned out good bands but um there at, does somewhere along the line portland became really known as a music city um late 80s early 90s portland was just a dangerous city it was hard you know i think a lot of big touring bands thought of it as like a logging town and uh it was dangerous there was a huge skinhead contingent that attended a lot of the shows and uh, lots of violence. And so the Portland of today is really nothing like that. Nothing like it. It's, it's uh, the show Portlandia, a lot of people get mad at its irony, but uh, some of it's kind of spot on. <laughs> some of it's pretty on, the, on point, but you know, whatever. People are trying to live well and enjoy themselves and dress how they want to dress and You know, I have no problem with any of that personally. You know, if people want to be ironic, it's just a reflection of the time. It's a reflection of people being apathetic and frustrated and, and God damn it, I'm just going to have fun even if the world's going down in flames. There are also people that really care about issues. Yeah, they really care, you know, and that plays into the Portlandia themes too. So, um, but, the, but outside of the kind of lighter vibe that I'm talking about, you know, there's a lot of very serious people there. They're serious about their food, serious about art, serious about, about their music, serious about their freedom to create and wear what they want and be who they are and, um, and then find like-minded people and create community. And that's really strong in Portland. And there are tons of bands that are working in Portland to, to really make excellent music. Um, so, and, and that's true of many cities in, in the world, but Portland is a, it's a unique flavor in that. So, you know, when you hear a Portland band, there's, it's usually not a surprise, you know, you're, they're from Portland, you know, it's not, it's more like where I'm from. When people hear that Yob is from Eugene, they're like, Yob's from Eugene? That's more of a surprise than if, I mean, I think Portland kind of adopted us, you know, we're okay with that. <laughs>
vient d'écouter Poison ID avec Town Hall. Poison ID, un groupe culte originaire de Portland. Ultime question de notre rencontre avec My Shade. Qu'en est-il d'un nouvel album si jamais Un nouvel album, il y aura dans le futur. If another album gets heard by us, it'll be one that we're really happy with. That's all I could say. I don't know that uh, it's not to say anyone else would be. Yeah, you know, we we all feel like we have to do some after this tour, and we have a handful of shows in the Northwest afterward, and we're going to do a show with the School of Rock in Portland um, in December with the kids. And, uh, and they're not really kids; they're you know teenagers, but you know they're very very talented and. Uh, we played a show actually with School of Rock where they did, uh, it was Acid King, Us, the School of Rock opened doing Sad Wings of Destiny beginning to end. And so it was all, uh, you know, probably 15 to 18 year old, 19 year olds. Um, and they were all switching instruments throughout the whole set, switching vocals, but the whole Sad Wings of Destiny record. And they completely, best band of the night. <laughs> no one could have, no one could have touched them. So it was so good and they were so in it. Um, and technically good like they really nailed it so it was incredible so we're going to play with them and they're going to do a yob song and uh but i think after that our, our goal is just to really chill and uh get back into our jobs and write and not have a touring pressure because we have toured quite a bit in the last couple of years and and it's all been carefully planned so i think that the amount of touring that we've done has really helped you know kind of it's done a lot of good things for us and the people that come see us see, still seem excited um if we kept doing it at this rate it that would change um and so we have to go back and let things breathe for a while and uh write and we know that we need to come up with some new vibes and a new a new us while still having a foot in where we've been and uh but I don't even have any idea what that looks like yet. Yob effectuera la dernière date de sa tournée européenne le vendredi 14 octobre au Trix dans le cadre du Desert Fest. Merci à Lauren pour m'avoir arrangé cette interview et merci surtout à Mike pour sa gentillesse. Pour finir cette émission, je vous propose Catharsis issu de l'album du même nom qui reste tout de même un morceau majeur dans la discographie du groupe. N'hésitez pas aussi à vous plonger dans l'album Stay Awake, album solo de Mike Shade qui est paru via Twill Jockey. On se donne rendez-vous le mois prochain pour de nouvelles aventures. N'oubliez pas que Liberation Frequency, c'est aussi une émission qui a lieu tous les lundis soirs à partir de 21h30 sur les ondes de Radio Campus Bruxelles. Il existe un compte Mixcloud et une fanpage sur Facebook pour suivre nos émissions. Bye 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 you.
Direct Angle